My sermon this morning is about Jesus being a friend of sinners. And, you know, God is in the business of saving. He's in the business of restoring and healing broken people, people who are lost and have need of hope. Now, some people really have got this, and we're among them if we've given our hearts to the Lord. They understand that they need God to intervene in their lives. Some people do, and I pray that you do this morning. Others, however, don't understand exactly what they need. And the emptiness that fills their spirit gnaws at them deeply. And they don't necessarily recognize that that deep gnawing sensation, that emptiness inside is actually a heart cry out to God. Now some, well all that, um, that feel this gnawing emptiness, in order to try and uh, lighten the load, I guess you could say, of the burden, try to fill that gnawing emptiness with the pursuit of things in this material world. And not just with things in the material world, but they try to numb the emptiness that they feel with addictions. This is where you have alcoholism and drug addiction, addiction to pornography, addiction to um, materialism. Some people just can't feel right unless they got something new in their hand that they purchased in the department store. But all of this is a gnawing, uh, an attempt to somehow dull this gnawing sensation. We, try, we might try to ignore that sensation or fill it with the pursuits of things in this material world. But all of us, let, when, when it comes down to it, Spiritually, without Christ, we are sinners at the deepest core of our being. We're really like lepers, paralytics, and tax collectors inside that need a healing touch. Sin has had its way through our society and none of us will escape its wages on our own. And whether people come to realize it or not, they need, they desperately need a savior. And this is why the gospel accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus strike such a deep chord within the human spirit. Because inwardly, whether we're believers or not, when we hear the words of Christ, there is something that touches. Now you can harden yourselves and push away from that, or you can respond. And we can all relate to these characters <laughs> that are presented in the Bible. Today our text is in Mark chapter 2, and we'll be looking at chapter uh, 2, verse 13 to 17 to start. So that's Mark 2, 13 to 17. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many that were following him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but it is the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. May God bless the reading of his word. After Jesus had performed 
the miracles in Capernaum. He and his disciples, they went back down to the Sea of Galilee, and a large crowd was following them. And as Jesus was teaching these people along the way, there was this tax collector as they were walking along. There was this tax collector here, Levi, the son of Alphaeus, also called Matthew in the parallel passage in Matthew 9. Very common in those days for people to have two names. But Matthew, or Levi, he was not a man of good character. We need to understand this. Tax collectors were not men of good character in those days. If he was a devout Jew, he would never have been a tax collector for Rome. Tax collectors were despised by the people of that day. They were Jews who worked for the Romans, and this made them traitors. People resented paying the heavy taxes to foreigners who ruled over them. And, and further this, to this, tax collectors were most often dishonest and abused the system by taking far too much. The tax collectors in that day took their own cut of the pie along with the taxes that were collected and given to the Roman Empire. So he wasn't a man of good character. With Jesus, however, there is pardon and mercy for the greatest of sinners. And great grace to change the hearts of the greatest sinners and make them holy. This is a trademark of the Lord. He's a potter. When he looks at his lumps of clay, regardless if it's in the first century or now, he looks at that lump of clay and he works at us despite our rough beginnings. And all of us here that are gathered today that have come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ can be thankful for his mercy and his grace. For like Matthew, most of us were pretty rough specimens of humanity when Jesus called out to us, weren't we? The Apostle Paul spoke of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 to 30. He says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things. And the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Powerful scripture. Isn't that powerful when you think about that? Jesus sees to the heart of a person and in the case of Levi or Matthew, a tax collector, he saw a man who was tired of sin. He saw past the externals. He saw a man who was tired of sin, someone who understood that he was a sinner and was ready to repent and leave evil behind to follow the Lord. I'm sure Jesus walked by numerous tax collectors in the scriptures in the day in which he walked. But there was something about Matthew or Levi that he saw that was, that was workable. Jesus asked his tax collector to follow. He even went over to Matthew's house for dinner and met with some of his friends and associates, all of whom were distasteful to the Pharisees and the religious crowd that was watching. And some of them were following Christ as well. But there is a parable that is told in one of the other Gospels which displays exactly what God saw in Levi. 
that cynical men observing from the outside could not see. Jesus told a parable in Luke chapter 18, 9 to 14. And I think this parable really speaks to what happened with the calling of this disciple. Luke 18, 9 to 14, to some who looked, to, to some who were confident, rather, of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all that I, ha I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And all those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, man often looks to the external qualities of a person when they make judgments about that person. But God sees through all of the exteriors and to the heart. God looks through all the exteriors in you and he sees your heart exactly where it is. And he knows exactly the keys to your heart. And he calls out to you. The question is, do you yield to the Holy Spirit? Or do you say, no, I'm going to do it my way. No human beings are in their nature righteous. Not, sing not a single one of us sitting here can be claiming to have earned the right to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. None of us. However, these Pharisees, they pretended to be righteous. Jesus did not come to call those who are haughty, arrogant, and self-righteous, having only an external form of godliness, but in reality were filled with wicked pride, claiming they were not sick with sin, and that they were in a healthy relationship with God, but not recognizing that they were actually really sin sick. So sick, in fact, they, can't, they couldn't even see their illness. And they were in need of the great physician. But Jesus came to call those who were like the tax collector in our passage this morning. The Apostle Matthew, who stood humbly at a distance, knowing that he was a sinner, humbling himself before God and calling on God to have mercy on him. And Jesus saw through the crowds of people as he was walking on, and he saw him and he said, that man is calling out to me inside and I will call him to follow me. <laughs> what a beautiful story. Because you and I were just walking in the crowd. And somewhere Jesus called us by name. And he said, come and follow me. And maybe you're still not, your mind still isn't made up on this and you're still struggling with this, but Jesus has seen you and he calls out to you. Will you listen? Will you yield to the master? Romans 10, 13, 11 to 13, we're told this. As scripture says, Anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord over all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's hope for every man. It doesn't matter if they're uh, a criminal. It doesn't matter if they're a politician. It doesn't matter if they're a uh, a policeman. It doesn't matter if they're a housemaker, a homemaker, or a carpenter, or a biker, or a 
whatever. You can put a label on it. It doesn't matter where that person is. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And God sees through all of the exteriors. And he sees to the heart. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, the gospel is power. It's the power of God because there is hope for every man. Amen? And we got to believe this. Church, we got to believe it. God, forgive us for, for judging exteriors and looking to the exteriors. There is no one that is outside of the spectrum of hope for salvation. No matter what we see on the outside. Hmm. The lessons in this story should not be lost to us. As believers in Jesus, we should never shut ourselves up in Christian communities and just stay there. Rather, we should be willing to befriend those who do not know the Lord Jesus. That means sometimes getting our hands dirty. And yes, sometimes putting up with some things that might disturb our sensibilities. But nonetheless, Salt must go into the decay before it can preserve, before it can add flavor. Light must shine in the darkness before the darkness can be illuminated. You are a light on a hill. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Therefore, shine your light before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. God has given each of us a mission field with people that we have had contact with maybe through our years of no, not knowing the Lord. Maybe it's through family. Maybe it's through our workplace. Maybe it's just bumping into people downtown or being involved in a community organization or anything like that. All those people are precious to the Lord. Unfortunately, I think God's trying to get our attention as a church. This is not just about a gathering on Sunday morning. This is about the kingdom of God going forward and seeing people saved from the pit of hell. That's what it has to be about. Our master's business is all about salvation and gathering the wheat into his barn, and that ought to be our goal as well. So, And I don't say this to browbeat. I'm looking at myself as much as I am everyone else here, right? But this is our mission. Rather than being influencers, unfortunately, in the North American church, so many have been influenced. Influenced by what? By the attitudes that pervade our society, the attitudes of wickedness. wickedness, The actions allowing things into our lives and into our homes that ought not be there. It's where if the salt loses its saltiness, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast down and trampled under the foot of men. But God's desire is not that we are salt that has lost its saltiness, but salt that has its savor and salt that gets into the decay and salt that takes the gospel with feet and hands and goes out and speaks out of love just as Jesus was a friend of sinners. And his love translated into crossing the cultural boundaries that were set, that said, you should not cross that. The Pharisees were looking across the boundaries and saying, what are you doing? Fellowshipping with sinners and tax collectors. Don't you know that bad company corrupts good character? But they took the word of God out of context. It's much easier to isolate ourselves from the wicked world than to, to get ourselves out there because there's a bit of a risk, right? And nobody likes those kind of risks. There's a risk that we're going to get rejected, a risk that we're going to come into a scenario that we don't know how to handle. But Jesus has given us everything we need to do the, the job. You know that? You as a believer have been given the Holy Spirit so when you go out there and you, and, you, and, you, and you decide that you're going to be part of your neighbor's lives, whatever your neighbor is, whoever your neighbor is, when you do that, the Holy Spirit's going to give you the insight to be able to minister in that place. And you might not even think you're doing any good. I've had scenarios, and you probably have too, where you go out and you think, am I doing any good here? 
Am I actually making a difference here? And all of a sudden, you know, months later, you find out that something small you said made all the difference in the world. There's people that got saved over little things. Why? Because God's been working on them for a lot longer than, than, than you being put into their life. And you just happen to be a catalyst that he's used to, to bring some truth there that goes boom and the light goes on. That happens. It happens and we can't forget this. No, we don't have a lot to offer, but God multiplies the bread, right? He calls us to distribute the bread. This is the lesson that we ought not to be concerned with the externals of associating with people that do not know Christ because somehow, somewhere along the way, this idea has come that the world ought to conform to the Christian principles that we live by, and if they don't, we should avoid, completely avoid them. Now, it's not talking about avoiding them. It's talking about avoiding the sin that they're entangled with. So Jesus, being a friend of sinners and tax collectors, was with them, but he did not sin with them. In other words, you don't go to the, the pub and have, you know, get drunk with your friend that isn't a Christian and talk about religion when you're drunk. Right? That's just not how you do evangelism. Right? That's what I'm trying to say. Okay? But maybe, maybe you should be with Uncle Bert at his house and he might be a little bit under uh, the influence because maybe he's always under the influence. He's always a little bit pickled. And you know what? Maybe every, every, every second sentence he says some curse word or something like that. It, it, if, it, it, it disturbs our sensibilities. Yeah, you know what? Jesus was grieved by the sin too, but yet he loved in the midst of it all. And he calls us to do the same. And that means putting up with it and not judging the world. The Bible has lots to say about not judging the world. God will judge the world. In the end, everyone's going to have to answer before him. But in the meantime, now we see as we move on, Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will, the time will come when the bride... Oh, boy. Sorry. My page got stapled in the wrong order. <laughs> but the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. And on that day, they will fast. In the Old Testament, did you know that fasting was instituted as an expression of deep sorrow before God? Lamenting for something that was wrong or missing that a person wished God to intervene in on make and make right. That's the context, if you look at the Old Testament, of fasting in the Old Testament. Now, the Pharisees, on the other hand, they fasted out of tradition and routine ritual, and they used that ritual to display, display a false sense of humility. And Jesus warned his disciples not to follow that example. Um, the fasting of the Pharisees was done to look good in front of others um, so that they would be uh, recognized as men of God, as spiritual men. It was all to do with externals. It was all to do with ritual. It was all to do with looking good before men. The Pharisees, they loved being the center of attention and being highly regarded. And Matthew said it in... Uh, Chapter 6, 16 of his gospel, he said this. When you fast, he says, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their full reward in full. 
On the contrary, Jesus told the Pharisees and these people here that he was like the bridegroom and the disciples were like the guests. Nothing was wrong and nothing was missing. Jesus was with them. Can you imagine being one of the disciples and walking with Jesus? How wonderful it would be to see the Messiah face to face interacting with the world around you. Can you imagine what a blessing that is? What a wonder that is? And Jesus is like, I'm a bridegroom, and these guys are my guests. So they're not fasting. Everything was good. There was no reason for them to mourn, to have sorrow or to fast at that time. And the Lord referring to himself as the bridegroom is significant. It's a significant scripture. And, you know, Sometimes when we read the Bible, we don't really get the full picture based on our cultural, you know, we don't have the same ceremonies and stuff that they did, and, and we, we lose some things because of the culture. But in, in Jesus referring him to himself as the bridegroom in the Old Testament, the bridegroom would, would, uh, would go away, and, and he'd make preparations for the marriage and all of that, and then all of a sudden he'd come back, and, and the marriage would happen, and, and it would be a wonderful celebration, and then there would be this unification in this marriage. But when he said to these Pharisees that he was the bridegroom, Isaiah chapter 54, this is seated in the Old Testament. Isaiah 54 says this, Isaiah 54, 4. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. This is a prophetic word about Jesus Christ being the bridegroom. He is the creator of the world. Your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. Jesus, the name above all names that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. What a powerful, this is seated in the Old Testament, and the Pharisees were students of the Old Testament. So when he says he's the bridegroom, if they were students of the Old Testament, they, they would have caught this. In Hosea chapter 2, 19 to 20, God says of himself towards Israel, I will betroth you to me forever, I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. In Isaiah 62, 5, it says this, As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. So when Jesus is likening himself here to the bridegroom, he was leaving a very strong hint that he was the redeemer, that he was the creator, that he in fact was the living word of God, God in the flesh who was present in the earth. And it's like what was written in John chapter 1. We're familiar with John 1. A lot of us have read that many times. John chapter 1, 9 and 10. Where it's written about Jesus, the living word. The true light that gives light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. These Pharisees did not recognize Jesus for who he was. Although he was the Holy One of Israel, according to the scriptures, the Redeemer of the people, the Bridegroom as spoken of in the Old Testament, that they had studied, by the way, <laughs> and he was their creator. The Pharisees couldn't see who he was because they were spiritually blinded by their own pride and self-righteousness. As a matter of fact, they would be the orchestrators of the crucifixion of the Lord. And Jesus knew it. Jesus also prophetically stated in this passage that we read that one day he'd be taken away from his disciples and they would miss him. And on that day, they would have occasion to fast. You know, there's something about fasting. 
And I, I think sometimes we as churches could learn. God, it's time for us to fast and to pray. The bridegroom will be coming soon. But we miss him, don't we? We miss him. And we mourn for the, the state of affairs that we see around us, the brokenness of this world. Or at least we should. Do we recognize how close it is coming to the coming of Jesus? Do we see, do we hear the approaching hoofbeats of the horsemen of the apocalypse that are nearly upon us? No man knows the time frame, but we know as history marches along and as we are in the last days that it becomes louder and louder and louder, and the time is short, and it's not for us to gather into our little places and huddle. It's all about us getting busy about our master's business because Patience on the timing of the Lord means salvation for those that are lost. So rather than getting our heads in the sand and looking at ourselves, it's time for us to look at Jesus and say, Lord, how would you have me to serve you in this hour of darkness? How would you have me to go out into all the world and take your gospel into the places where you have placed me? Because this is not about me. This is about you. This is about populating heaven. Because hell is very real. And people are going to be pouring into hell. And we have only so many breaths in the life that we've been given. So what are we doing with that breath that God has given us? How are we responding to it? Are we guarding ourselves and trying to make ourselves a little kingdom here on the earth? I say this to myself. I say this to all of the Christians that are out there. It is time for us to wake up. It is time for us to wake up, but not in the way of waking up in the world. Not, not in the way of just raising awareness for the sake of awareness so that we can huddle, but for the sake of the gospel so that we can take the gospel effectively into our community for the name of Jesus Christ because he loves those people that are perishing. He loves your uncle the one that everyone else has forgotten about. He loves the tax collector. He loves the policeman. He loves the biker. He loves the housewife. He loves the carpenter. He loves them. And he's given us his gospel, the good news. How does he ask us to be involved? Not all of us are teachers. So if you're not a teacher... You're not going to be a teacher. Not all of us are evangelists. But we're to do the work of an evangelist. What? Be because of your testimony. The light shining within you is something that they need to see. And how do they see unless, unless we go? And what does that mean? Don't forget about the uncle. Maybe go visit him. Give him a phone call. Send him a card. Whatever. God will show you. He'll lead you. The Holy Spirit gives you people in your thoughts so that you can act, not just so that you can, you can store that up as good information for later. Act? How? First of all, I, I'm reading this book. Um, by Eugene Perry Peterson right now, and it's just blowing my mind. It's called Sub Subversive Spirituality. And this book, oh, it's just like, he's like, there is need, and there is a need for us to care about the need, but we can't get the need before the, ma the, meter, the meter of the need. You can meet needs all day long and go out there and meet needs, meet needs, meet needs, meet needs, and it's not going to make a hill of beans difference in the end because everyone just goes back to the way they were. The question is, every time we think about need, we should be on our knees saying, God, how is it that you want me to be involved in this? Show me, Lord. Create the pathways, Lord, for us as a church and for me individually to meet a need that you desire me to meet. So that it's not just a need that's being met, but it's a spearhead into the life of that beautiful person that God created that he loves. So that they will hear the words of the gospel and come to Christ. That's what, he need. That's what we need to do.
See, the Pharisees didn't recognize Jesus for who he was. He was the Holy One of Israel. The Pharisees couldn't see who he was because they were spiritually blinded. But Jesus reached out to disciples like Levi. And people like you and me. And he said, follow me. Follow me. Let everything else behind. Let it go. And follow me. And I will teach you on what it is that you are to do, to do in my kingdom on my behalf. And he'll teach us. And he'll lead us. And the Lord continues to explain in verses 21 and 22, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth onto an old garment, he said to these people, to try and drive this home. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. And what the Lord was saying to the Pharisees, who were judging him at this time, that he didn't come into the world to patch Judaism with a new thing, because it would result in the destruction of both the system and what was in the system. He came to fulfill the old covenant. Jesus fulfilled the old covenant, and, and he came to implement a new covenant with people and redeem them. If he merely patches Judaism, the patch will tear away from the old, and the Jews will, are, were going to be worse off in the end than in the beginning. Jesus is stating, really, what he's stating here is he's not into band-aid solutions. putting a patch on an old garment. God's not just about making your life better, people. He's about giving you new life. God wants us to take the old man and have the old man put down and make you new. And that's the gospel, is that old can be gone and new can come. The old is all crusty, brittle, and inflexible, like old wineskin. When filled with the new wine of the new covenant in Christ, these wineskins, they're not flexible enough and will wind up bursting. The wine then spills out and is wasted. No. The freedom of the grace-filled life that Jesus was promoting can't fit into inflexible and legalistic rules that the Pharisees were enforcers of. This is why Jesus' disciples did not just follow the tradition of fasting for the sake of tradition and appearances. Jesus came to set them free from such things as that, and he came to fulfill the requirements of the law and to make one new man. You know, when you come to Christ, old things are passed away. All things are become new. You know, flexible heart that's willing to stretch, that's willing to learn, that's willing to sit at the feet of Jesus and hear what he has to say and absorb that into life and to apply it. That's, about, that's what the new man, the one new man's all about. In fact, the Lord's statement to the Pharisees is a statement on how he would be establishing his kingdom and and God explains his purposes to us in establishing his kingdom in Galatians chapter 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not yourself, let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Luke 4.18 says it this way. Jesus told all the people listening to him as to the purposes of why he came into the world. He stated, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. God's delight is to see his people set free from the yoke of sin and bondage that held them captive. That means you. That means me. He delights in our freedom. Whom the Son sets free they shall be free indeed. 
And the Pharisees, they didn't think of themselves as sinners who needed a Savior. Their pride had led, led them to be self-reliant, even though they were as broken as any paralytic, unclean as any leper, and oppressed in spirit as any tax collector. It bothered them when Jesus called people to be his disciples that appeared to be less than what they thought they were. But Jesus didn't bend to their pressure. He saw the brokenness of the human condition and he called out. He had compassion despite people's imperfections and sin. And he called them to repent and follow him. Jesus paved the way to right relationship with God. Ultimately, by his call here, but through his work on the cross and his triumph over the grave. As many who had received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons and daughters of God. And Jesus knew that soon with his disciples in this passage, that he'd be taken away from them, that they would be fasting and would praying and would long for his return. And from the time of the first disciples to now, Jesus calls women and children from all corners of the world, and men and women and children from all corners of the world to follow him. And he knows that our hearts are going to face this world and its full force of evil. But he says that he's going to be with us through it all. And he gave us his grace so that even though we were broken and lost, even though we were greatest, the greatest of sinners, Christ died for us and reconciled us to himself because of his great love and because of who he is. If you've made a decision to follow Jesus, that's awesome. But maybe there's someone here today that you're undecided. Maybe there's someone listening to this broadcast over the internet. You're undecided. You, you see what I'm saying? And the Spirit of the Lord is cutting you in your heart right now, and you are in the valley of decision. Let me ask you. Today, if you hear in your heart what the Spirit is saying to you, don't delay in putting it off. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ and surrender your life to Him. Give Him all that you are and have inside, and He will give you His Spirit. He'll restore you, and He'll give you new life, one new man. You can be one new man today. 